ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय Shrimad Bhagavatam, 8th Canto, Chapter 24, Matsya, the Lord's Fish Incarnation, Text 31. Shri Shukavacha, Shri Shukavacha, Iti Bruvanam Nirpatim Jagatpati, Iti Bruvanam Nirpatim Jagatpati, Satchavratam Matsyavapur Yugatshay, Satyavrata spoke in this way. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, who at the end of the Yuga had assumed the form of a fish to benefit his devotee and enjoy his pastimes in the water of inundation, responded as follows. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, O King, who can subdue your enemies on the seventh day from today, the three worlds, Bhu, Bhuva, and Swa, will all merge into the water of inundation. When all the three worlds merge into the water, a large boat sent by me will appear before you. Thereafter, O king, you shall collect all types of herbs and seeds and load them on that great boat. 
Then, accompanied by the seven rishis and surrounded by all kinds of living entities, you shall get aboard that boat and without moroseness, you shall easily travel with your companions on the ocean of inundation, the only illumination being the effulgence of the great region. Then, as the boat is tossed about by the powerful winds, attach the vessel to my horn by means of the great serpent Vasuki, for I shall be present by your side. Pulling the boat with you and all the rishis in it, O king, I shall travel in the water of devastation until the night of Lord Brahma's slumber is over. Purple. This particular devastation actually took place, not during the night of Lord Brahma, but during his day, for it was during the time of Chakshusha Manu. Brahma's night takes place when Brahma goes to sleep. But in the daytime, there are 14 manus, one of whom is Chakshusha Manu. Therefore, Shila Vishnu Chakrari Thakur comments that although it is daytime for Lord Brahma, Brahma felt sleepy for a short time by the supreme will of the Lord. This short period is regarded as Lord Brahma's night. This has been elaborately discussed by Shila Rupa Goswami in his Lagu Bhagavatamrita. The following is a summary of his analysis. Because Augusta Muni cursed Swayamuva Manu, during the time of Swayamuva Manu, a devastation took place. This devastation is mentioned in the Matsya Purana. During the time of Chakshusha Manu, by the supreme will of the Lord, there was suddenly another pralaya or devastation. This is mentioned by Markandeya Rishi in the Vishnu Dharmotra. At the end of Manu's time, there is not necessarily a devastation, but at the end of the Chakshusha Manvatara, the Supreme Personality Godhead, by his illusory energy, wanted to show such a Vrata the effects of devastation. Srila Sridhar Swami also agrees with this opinion. The Lagu Bhagavatamrita says, and you have several Sanskrit verses, but not the translation. Om Ajnana Timurandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshuri Militang Yena Tazmai Shri Gurave Namah Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasudhi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare The science of the avatars is very intricate. Uh, Krishna is unlimited. His incarnations are unlimited. And the details about those incarnations are also unlimited. The Lago Bhagavatamrita is mentioned here. The work by Rupa Goswami. Uh, that's due to be published in BBT edition later this year. And there you'll see all these avatar intricacies uh, elaborated upon. Uh, in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, it is stated, Deva Tiryan Naradashu. The Supreme Personality of God had appears as a demigod, uh, as a human being, even uh, in animal forms. And just like you can't count all the waves in the ocean, similarly you cannot count all the avatars. Sometimes people ask, would you Krishna devotees be open to an avatar appearing that's not mentioned in Srimad Bhagavatam? If you're truly non-sectarian, you should be open to whatever God can do. And so, suppose some extraordinary personality appears uh, and gives teachings. Would you be open to that if you're truly non-sectarian, if you're truly lovers of the supreme absolute truth? What would you say to that? <laughs> or 
In other words, the implication is, are you just closed-minded and you have a fixed set of avatars that you'll accept and anything outside that fixed set you will not acknowledge. But the Shastra explains that human beings are only authorized to accept the avatars listed in Srimad Bhagavatam. That doesn't mean they're not other avatars. As Bhagavatam explains and Prabhupada elaborates in the purports in the first canon, they're un unlimited avatars in every species of life. Sometimes they always get a bit whimsical and ask, what about the tomato avatar? <laughs> Still, the fact is, in every species of life, the Supreme Personality of Godhead appears uh, in a form and with a mission suitable for that particular species. The idea that God has created the universe and then abandoned it uh, is totally uh, refuted by Srimad Bhagavatam. As Krishna says himself in Bhagavad Gita, he comes regularly because otherwise all the worlds could be ruined because he's not, if he did not take a personal interest in rectifying the situations. Every species of life, there is an avatar. But to spare us from confusion, to spare us from being deceived, human beings are authorized only to accept the incarnations listed in Srimad Bhagavatam. And in that way, because Shastra is the proof, we're spared from unnecessary speculation. This is not being closed-minded. This is being very practical. This is acknowledging the limited and imperfect senses of the human being. And this stance also acknowledges our dependency on Shastra. We may use so much logic and reason in our presentations, but the ultimate proof is not the analogy, it's not the logic, it's what's stated in the Shastra. We're not ashamed to be Shastra bound. It may appear that we're restricted by relying simply on Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, we're not open to whatever, <laughs> especially in California, but not only California, but other parts of the world. You've got to show you're open <laughs> as soon as you restrict yourself. That means you're not really spiritual. You've got to be open to anything and everything without. And if you're really a Paramahansa, you make no judgments, no discrimination, no distinction. Anything is as good as anything else. Then you're really spiritual. And of course, the usual mantra, all paths lead to the same place. So why have you chosen to exclusively focus on the Krishna path as if it's going to take you somewhere that other paths cannot take you? If you're truly spiritual, if you're truly open-minded, broad-minded, then you'll realize that all these paths are just different portals leading to the same place. And therefore, there's no point in you mm, focusing on the Krishna path. You could choose any path. You will get to the same place. Have no fear. Have no doubt. <laughs> well, first of all, what is that same place? <laughs> Tell us what that is first. <laughs> then we might agree that all the paths get there. <laughs> <laughs> but if you can't tell us what that place is, what the destination is, then why should we listen to you about how all the paths lead to that unknown place? 
And, as I may have explained before, this notion that all paths lead to the same place implies that the person who said that has some superior vantage point. He's like up in a, in a helicopter and he can see all the roads converging on the same destination. But who has that vantage point? Who actually has the factual vision and experience of how all the paths lead to the same place? No one knows what that same place is, and they've never seen all the roads converging on that place. But they'll play with your mind and say things like that. If you're really spiritual, if you're really open, you'll understand all the roads lead to the same place. And you'll understand that Bhagavatam is a nice book full of inspiring myths that motivate you to develop your human qualities. In the past, myth had a negative connotation, in the 50s, maybe the 60s. And anything considered myth was deemed inferior. But now, humanity has progressed. Humanity has become more open. And we understand that myth has so much instructive value. So, often you can meet persons who say, especially university professors, uh, we appreciate the bhakti myths. <laughs> We're open. <laughs> Matsya? <laughs> sure. Obviously a myth. I mean, fish incarnation? Really? <laughs> Do you really accept that? But there's a lesson in, in this mythology buried deep within the symbols. <laughs> Buried deep within the pageantry of the various incarnations, there's a message for our growth. And so we're open to that. And we appreciate you Krishna people and your myths because you add color to human society. <laughs> That's considered the mm, progressive way of considering the subject matter of the avatars. Myths are positive. I like to point out that think of Shukadeva Goswami speaking to Pritchard Maharaj and all the assembled sages from various parts of the universe. They had gathered on the bank of the Ganga to witness Shukadeva Goswami delivering Srimad Bhagavatam. And in that deliverance of Srimad Bhagavatam, Shukadeva Goswami explained the coming Kali Yuga. He explained the characteristics of human beings in the age of darkness. How persons wouldn't take a bath, how they would feel so proud because of their long hair, how men and women would live together simply based on sexual attraction with no lasting marriage commitment. How a man would be considered expert, superlatively expert, if he could maintain one wife and two kids. <laughs> so, uh, you can consider, perhaps, how the sages, <laughs> they can be so astonished at hearing about such degradation Consider their response could be, this, this is myth. How could human beings sink so low? But, okay, of course, we're living amongst it. What is myth depends on your perspective. If, because the activities of the avatars of the Lord are so inconceivable to one's tiny brain, why? Do you automatically categorize it as myth just because you, your tiny brain can't accommodate it? You could easily flip the situation over and say that human beings would ever live as they're living now? That's got to be myth. How can humanity sink so low? <laughs> How can human society live in the presence of nuclear weapons that are more than a thousand times more powerful than the nuclear bombs that dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. <laughs> how, how, 
how can the human society live with all that? A thousand times more powerful than a nuclear bomb that finished off a whole city? And we're, we're talking about peace and prosperity. <laughs> The subject matter of the Lord's form is very important because unless you accept that the Supreme Personality of Godhead can take many forms, yet those forms are all spiritual, you can be fooled into thinking that these are just various human projections. Human beings know about fish, so why not a fish avatar? Human beings notice, they know about tortoises, why not a tortoise avatar? Uh, psychologists will say that, that. These are just projections of your mind. They're remnants of when human beings worship nature, uh, thinking that there is uh, personality behind various parts of nature, so now, Human beings are projecting that there is a fish god or a tortoise god. If the Supreme Personality God and Supreme Absolute Truth is perfect and complete, everything is there. How can we restrict the Supreme Personality God saying you can't do this, you can't do that? How can we fence in the inconceivable abilities of the supreme absolute truth with our tiny brains we try to fence that fence the supreme lord in you can't do this you can't do that first of all <laughs> one has to establish that the supreme personality of god it can actually come to this world many people will say if there is god he can't come here or if there's god why would he want to come here <laughs> who would want to come to this place or he shouldn't come here and bother us and interfere with us. <laughs> we give praise and thanks to God, keep him away. <laughs> we don't want him here in the midst of our enjoyment, in the midst of our power and control. So first, Bhagavad Gita establishes that the Supreme Personality of Godhead can come. He explains himself. Not only that he can come, but also what is his main mission. And then Krishna describes the mechanism, so to speak, the technology, the spiritual technology by which he appears. He says, Ajopisan avyatma bhutana mishparopisan. First of all, I'm unborn. Of course, every living entity is actually unborn in that we're not the body. Krishna establishes, Aja, I'm unborn, and Avyatma, I have a form though, even though I'm unborn, and that form is inexhaustible. Our forms are not inexhaustible, our material bodies. The third thing Krishna points out, Bhutana Mishvara. I'm the Lord of all conscious entities. Nevertheless, I still can come. Even though I have these supreme characteristics and abilities, I can still come to the material world. But how do I come? Sambhavamiyatmamaya. I come my own way through my spiritual potency. In this way, Bhagavad Gita establishes that the personality, Krishna, on the battlefield of Kurukshetra was not an ordinary person. And you can't say, if there is God, what's he doing on the battlefield? Krishna can do whatever he likes. And he states his mission. He even gives a schedule for his appearances. Sahasya Yuga Payanta Ahaya Brahmano. He gives the schedule. At the same time, we should know. Krishna is not restricted to any schedule. But just so that human beings will not speculate and that they'll be able to rely on Shastra, there's a schedule given for the appearances of the Supreme Personality of God. In the second canto of Bhagavatam, 
Pritchard Maharaj was concerned that people would be confused about the Lord's accepting so many different forms. So he pointed out that couldn't it be said, he's questioning Shukadeva Goswami, couldn't it be said that just like a living entity assumes a material body, uh, similarly the Lord also assumes a body according to nature, material nature, even if that body is gigantic, like Garbhadakshaya Vishnu, the, the elephant has a body that's huge, uh, an ant has a body that's tiny, so couldn't there be, in other words, uh, a material process that the Lord assumes a gigantic body according to some particular material need. So in this way, Pritchard Maharaj is clearing the way for us to distinguish between the mere accepting bodies of different sizes and what is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He's pointing you in the direction of the difference in the quality of the bodies. In other words, he's not simply saying that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is Bhagavan because he has a big body. <laughs> That's actually not the ultimate criterion. The, the defining criterion is what's the quality of that body. And now we have Matsyavata. <laughs> Again, the same issues will be raised in the beginning of this chapter. What is the Supreme Personality of Godhead taking such an abominable form as a fish? On the Vedic scale of the development of consciousness and the various superiorities and inferiorities of bodies, fish rank the lowest. Jalaja Lavanakshani. Lower than plants. Fish, are, from the Vedic analysis, are considered less conscious than plants. They're the lowest. Yet the Supreme Personality of Godhead comes as Matsya, the fish incarnation. So Pritchard Maharaj wants to clarify, because here we see the Lord changing bodies, assuming different forms. Well, doesn't a living entity do that in the cycle of samsara, repeated birth and death? Uh, not only does it seem the Lord is changing forms in a way that conditioned souls do, but also, this particular form is known to be abominable, the lowest. So how can all this be done by the Supreme Personality of Godhead without any material contamination? This is the point that Pritchard Maharaj once explored. He's bringing this up to Shukadeva Goswami. For Shukadeva Goswami to describe how no matter what kind of body the Supreme Lord takes, there's never any contact with the material energy. There's never any taking on of material qualities. There's, there are never any material activities. This is the astonishing significance of the Matsya Avatar. In ordinarily what's considered such a lowly body, the lowest body, you have the pastimes, the leela of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And why? Why would the Supreme Personality of Godhead assume the form of a fish? If he is the Supreme Enjoyer, why not let God enjoy as a fish? <laughs> People go to the ocean to sport, but they have to always be worried about their breathing. <laughs> it's not their natural place, although they like bathing in the ocean and surfing and playing in the waves. <laughs> the Supreme Personality of God it can take the form of a fish for his own pleasure. <laughs> and also for the safety and protection of his dear devotees. The verse we first read said, <clears throat> Jana Priya 
Priyam. <clears throat> he assumed the form of a fish to benefit his devotee. That is no material purpose. Shukadeva Goswami elaborates that for the purpose of the devotee, for the purpose of protecting dharma, for the purpose of protecting proper lifestyles that lead to dharma for all these reasons. For the protection of the cows, the brahmanas, the demigods, the supreme personality of Godhead appears. Yet, he's not working. He's not doing some kind of chores or tasks in the ordinary sense. He's always enjoying. So therefore, when you hear about Matsya Avatar, you're hearing about the Supreme Lord's enjoyment. Swimming through the waters of inundation. What is normally the most frightening scene, there is the Supreme Personality God in enjoying. So why should we restrict the glories of the Supreme Personality of God in with our tiny brains, with our tiny speculations? The science of the avatars is the real subject matter for human civilization to focus on. Avatar Kata talks about the avatar. These, these talks will purify the human being and human society from their intense contamination by the modes of material nature. Shil Prabhupada was once describing how an ideal human civilization should be. He was describing a rural situation in India where the villagers would work in the fields during the day and then when the field work was over, they would walk towards a place where Hari Kata, Avatar Kata was being discussed by the local sadhus. And then when the talks were over in the late evening, the people would walk back to their houses. And as they're walking back to their houses, they would be reciting and uh, going over. They'd get home after talking about it on the way, and they get home and take rest, and then they would simply dream about the talks of Krishna, the talks of the avatars. So Srila Prabhupada explained, this is real human civilization. Of course, what would our response be? But no television, <laughs> no internet. They get home and there's no internet, no email. <laughs> they have no smartphones, <laughs> no movies, no DVDs. <laughs> the civilization is evaluated not in terms of its technological intricacy, but in terms of its focus on the science of the supreme Bhagavad Dharma. And this is what Bhagavatam is gradually changing us to understand. By daily hearing Bhagavatam, your standards for evaluating civilization change completely. <laughs> As more and more you enter into the subject matter and you understand matsya, fish body, is not mythological. Uh, this is the the pleasure form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who's solving a particular situation with enjoyment. He wanted to show his devotee what it's like in an inundation, in, in a devastation, and he also wanted to enjoy sporting in the water. Once we accept the enjoyment of the Supreme Personality of Godhead as the ultimate principle of existence, then everything becomes clear. It's not that God has to work. It's not that he has to do things. He himself says this in Bhagavad Gita. I've got nothing to, I have no fruits I need to get. I have no goals I need to achieve. But still I come to this world and still I act for his pleasure, and at the same time, while he is enjoying, he takes care of his devotees, and he uplifts human society. 
This is the real science of God. It is not sectarian. It is not narrow and restrictive. By our reliance on Shastra, we can actually understand things that are beyond the senses. In other words, the Shastra is not restricting your sense perception. It is the portal through which your sense perception expands. You can understand the glories of the spirit soul. You can understand the glories of the supreme soul. You can understand the form, qualities, and activities of the supreme personality of Godhead. And most importantly, you can understand that there's no qualitative difference between the supreme personality of Godhead's name, form, qualities, pastimes. Therefore, Hearing about Krishna's activities is the same as seeing Krishna. It's the same as associating with Krishna. Hearing his name is the same as seeing him, as associating with him. This is the rarest status in life, to have factual knowledge of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and appreciation for his inconceivable activities in terms of his own enjoyment and in terms of taking care of his dear devotees. Any questions or comments from our senior Vaishnavas? Yes? <coughs> Thank you, Maharaj, for the wonderful class. Um, you mentioned during the class that Krishna Krishna's avatars uh, appear for the benefit of the devotees, dharma, cows, friends, and you know, we're happy to hear about these avatars and how they come and basically interacting with you know, living entities and that. Uh, here's my question is this, you know, I can understand how Krishna comes in you know, different incarnations and he benefits different living entities and, and sometimes he's, his mercy is even extended to living entities that don't seem particularly qualified like you know, you have Dhruva Maharaj who he was worshipping Krishna for to get a material desire fulfilled but in the process he, he got his material desire fulfilled and became a pure devotee and then you have a more extreme example of Gajendra, the elephant who wasn't worshipping Krishna really he was just in total desperation and distress calling out for Krishna, but he also got the mercy of Krishna that became liberated. And then you can have a more extreme example of somebody like Putana. She actually, he or she, however you want to refer to that living entity, came to kill Krishna, but because he, he or she presented himself like a mother and offered Krishna breast milk, Krishna took that and, you know, he took the motherly side, the devotional side, and, you know, gave, and Putana got Krishna's mercy. But, how can somebody like Kamsa get Krishna's mercy? I mean, what the heck, what, what is Kamsa's qualification? Kamsa not only wanted to, he didn't do anything devotional from what I could see. He just tried to, he wanted to kill Krishna, kill Krishna's brother, kill Krishna's mother, father, both sets of mothers and fathers, all the gopas, all the gopis, and probably anybody else that had any quality. He could kill all the Brahmins, kill all the cows. How could Kamsa possibly get Krishna's mercy? Kamsa, as Narada Muni describes in the seventh canto of Bhagavatam, was not an, actually an atheistic demon due to the fact that his constant meditation was always on, I've got to kill Vishnu, otherwise Vishnu is going to kill me. He's constantly absorbing that day and night. This is unfavorable devotional service. So you have to appreciate the meditation of Kamsa and how intense it was out of fear. I've been told that I was killed by Vishnu in the previous life and now I hear that Vishnu is coming again. This was, <laughs> he was so absorbed in that kind of samadhi that what does Narada Muni exclaim in the seventh canon? Oh, if only I had that kind of intensity to my bhajan that Kamsa and demons like him have in their animosity toward the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This is, a, this is a devotee. A devotee appreciates <laughs> everything in terms of its ability to inspire bhakti, 
pure devotional service. So Narada Muni is actually feeling spiritually inadequate. Okay, Kamsa is a demon, but look at that intensity of his focus on the Supreme Personality God. I don't have such intensity. <laughs> so that is the particular speciality of Kamsa. Day and night, all he would think about. I've got to kill Vishnu before Vishnu kills me. Or, he's like a computer that's locked up, you know? I've got to kill Vishnu, but Vishnu can't be killed. But I've got to kill him because he's going to kill me. He just, just a loop <laughs> constantly. <laughs> that is Kamsa's <laughs> situation. Yes, Savas Prabhu. Thank you very much for class. I was, I was thinking in your class as it was going on that we are, you know, we're a very personal movement. We always are professing that Krishna is the supreme personality of God and you know, we have a personal relationship and how we can develop that. Um, have you ever heard or from Prabhupada or, or read anything where there's a description of how the spirit soul goes to the spiritual world back to, let's say, Kaloka and now? Now, does that mean that, that you, you would think that that means there's billions of souls, billions upon billions of souls. Do all those souls develop an intimate relationship with the Lord on a daily basis? All the souls where? I'm sorry. In the spiritual world. Let's say the local world now. Uh. Do, because, for instance, if you're having like, if we read the pastimes, mm -hmm. There is certain individuals, hmm. souls, that have an intimate relationship with the Supreme Lord, that are like the Valley of Guru, etc. They were all delivered there, but not all of them had that intimate association. At least I don't think they have you know, I'm just asking that question. So my, my question comes to that, do we actually have, have you ever heard or read, that we actually have that personal relationship with the Lord in the spiritual world? Because Krishna has unlimited potency, he can perfectly reciprocate the love of unlimited living entities. This is the basis of nectar of devotion. Prabhupada explains that right in the beginning. He's, he wants you to have that confidence that Krishna can perfectly reciprocate your love. Not only in just one way, but Krishna can handle different approaches, different loving relationships with him, and perfectly satisfy each devotee. Yet and still, Krishna has particular devotees who are more intimate, but at the same time, Krishna can accommodate unlimited living entities in terms of perfect loving reciprocation. That actually is the prime characteristic of the Supreme Personality Godhead. The ability to perfectly reciprocate love with unlimited living entities. But your question is interesting. I remember when I first started reading Prabhupada's books and obviously I was approaching them with some speculation and uh, material ignorance. So I, I was reading about, I was reading the Krishna book and Krishna Leela and I was thinking, this sounds so wonderful, the spiritual world. I better hurry up and go there before it gets overcrowded. <laughs> wow, everyone's gonna wanna go there. The place is gonna be packed. There's gonna be no room for me. <laughs> so your question is, is valuable because I, I, I was thinking like that. Like, this is so good. Who wouldn't wanna play with Krishna, dance with Krishna? <laughs> I, I gotta get in on this. <laughs> <laughs> but then we read in the 10th canto how Krishna goes to the forest with unlimited cows and unlimited cowherd boys. <laughs> and it all fits into Vrindavan somehow. <laughs> Lord Chaitanya in Chaitanya Charitamrita gives the measurements for the Goloka planet. Uh, it's Glad none of probably remembers. What, what, what's this like? It's one times one hundred times a thousand times. In other words, just forget about measuring it. <laughs> so it's very important for us in our bhakti quest to understand that.
Krishna can perfectly reciprocate your love. Without understanding that, we'll naturally turn to the inadequacies of the material world for the fulfillment of our loving propensity. And that's where we make our mistakes. But if we, through knowledge and realization, begin to actually have confidence that Krishna will perfectly satisfy our loving propensity, then we start to make some significant spiritual advancement. Anything else? Yes. Sorry. Thank you, Maharaj. In your description about the little uh, speck about the real civilization that you were mentioned in Prabhupada, um, when I read it about those farmers, people who work in the field, in the world, in Krishna Kata, come back in Krishna Kata. I thought it came to mind that uh, we as, as, as preachers or helping the side of the movement uh, have a big task to try to uh, uh, adopt a little bit of that in big cities with more technology and everything. And then another thought came to my mind that when Narada Muni and Daksha had some interesting conversation, uh, Daksha has the task for procreating and like the management of the universe, not only has another, another business. His business is to get everyone out of this world as a preacher. Then uh, they both work under the guidance of the Lord in a different way. So my question was, was it is like a big challenge because in one sense, those who come from a belief in this material world, even if you try to convince them, still they, 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 they find many arguments to resist. But the Paramahansas, they actually just, well, they don't care. It's just like Renata Muni. He did it twice. And then the materialist, uh, in that case, Daksha, he's actually fighting back to the saddle. And he himself is also a, how do you say, like a, a clear medium for, for the Lord doing the management of the universe. So, would you like to make some comment? <laughs> well, you already commented. <laughs> In your ecstasy, you already commented. <laughs> well, maybe I can make a question that you have. So, even as a boy, sometimes, let's say, we uh, would like to, you know, we like spiritual life, but at some point, we like to utilize that famous quote, Yukta uh, Vairagya. And then we try to accommodate so many things and maybe to the, our level of consciousness of realization we say this is for Krishna's service. At what point it becomes actually no Yukta Vairagya or we are overdoing it? That requires good management to be able to discriminate between using something for Krishna's pleasure and becoming used by something and in that way become uh, contaminated by material nature. That requires expert management. This principle of yukta vairagya, we consider it to be quite ordinary in our talk. Uh, it's all for Krishna Prabhu, uh, it's all Krishna's energy. Uh, but Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasri Thakur explains that this principle of yukta vairagya is actually very confidential. It's just been made uh, so uh, pivotal in our sampradaya. Uh, it, the acharyas have brought it out, but it's actually mysticism in the topmost to be, look at everything as belonging to Krishna and skillfully engage everything in Krishna's service without any material motivation. That is high mysticism. So Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasri Thakur says that Yukta Vairagya is a confidential principle of Bhakti. Just Prabhupada took it and just expanded it all over the world. <laughs> we are going to get too late. Y'all know Bhakti Prabhu, can you forgive me? It's, Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Hare Krishna. <laughs>